My mother gave me lessons when I was about four and a half years old. And I think the thing that really, she'd been thinking about it for a while, but uh, the thing that really precipitated that was that I was very impetuous. Maybe it was the urge to improvise. But I was playing in a field across the street with my brother and uh, two friends that lived next door, and their mother called them to dinner. So they dropped everything and ran across the street, and my brother chased after him, right after him, Clarence. And then I said, hey, wait for me. And I was dashing across the street without looking, and the next thing I knew, I'm looking out from under the hood of a car. I'm looking up, and I'm underneath the car. And the car rolls up to my shoe, hit my shoe and snapped back like that and pulled the shoe off, but it didn't injure my feet. I was my foot, I wasn't hurt. But my mother was looking out the window and she said, I'm gonna give you something to keep you in this house. Kinney is one of the grand masters of Detroit jazz. The Baron, as he's affectionately known, comes from a family steeped in music and in the jazz tradition. He's a prime example of a highly individual and creative talent to have emerged from the Motor City. During his illustrious career, Harold McKinney has worked with such artists as Kenny Morrell, Wes Montgomery, Yusef Latif, John Coltrane, Donald Byrd, and James Moody. He's also a composer and arranger, just as important a jazz educator who's kept the flame alive in public schools and universities. The Baron has been active in the recording studio as well. In the early 1970s, he joined forces with fellow Detroiters Marcus Belgrave and Wendell Harrison to form the Tribe record label. Sharing with us his life and music, Harold McKinney.
wonder if the uh, if uh, an artist doesn't have a holistic view of life. It's not a specific thing. It's a, I've always been intrigued by, uh, you know, I guess death brought me uh, uh, people, seeing people die, it made life more uh, apparent to me or more, I uh, questioned it a lot more. Because uh, I guess in life you really know things uh, that are through comparisons. And I remember one morning I, I was looking out the window and uh, the two men brought the body of this man that lived across the street home. And he was draped across the banister or lying in front of, behind the uh, porch. I don't remember exactly, but uh, I, I know he was dead. And uh, two days later, they had his wake at the, at the uh, house, you see, and I went across there out of compelled curiosity to see what he looked like, you know. And, you know, he was a strange-looking guy in the first place. He had gray eyes. He was dark. And uh, he was up in his 40s or 50s, early 50s, and uh, he had a strange smile on his face all the time. And that smile was in the casket with him. And, you know, and so I began to think of, contemplate what life really is. What is it? It's the most marvelous uh, phenomenon, you know. Uh, the idea of person walking around one minute live, and then what happens to create the body that, I mean, to, uh, what's, what left the body that's lying in the coffin, you know? And the universe, what is that, you know? So I've, I think some of my, Many of my works are dedicated to that proposition. Processes, processes yeah. being. Well, as you were talking, I thought about um, George Lewis, the clarinetist out of mm -hmm. New Orleans, and I was thinking of a passage in his um, autobiography or biography as to how, as a young man, he was at home and he was standing be right near some banisters and he was looking across to where folks were playing music because they were playing this music because uh, a funeral was going on. And knowing that New Orleans tradition, I guess it's an African tradition which was mm -hmm. transplanted to New Orleans, mm -hmm. of, of identifying various phases and stages of a life through death mm -hmm. with the different types of musics played at different parts right. of the funeral. I can't help but wonder when you were looking at this fellow with these gray eyes and this beautiful dark complexion, this weird smile, if at some point that moment has appeared or reappeared in a musical composition? Well, uh, so you can show us. Actually, uh, I, at a very early age, I began to see colors in music. And at this particular morning, there was a dazzling side light and a gray overcast. And I got a real orange feeling from that. And the orange is always like to me either A flat or C minor. Improvising now.
recognizing uh, colors that mark the day uh, on at given times. I think these colors give you a spiritual feel of music. I mean, uh, when I thought of, uh, like for example, uh, there are some days that are gray and that have a hint of blue in it, and they are A minor. There are some days that have a tint of yellow in it, and they're D minor. Uh, I used to listen to Chopin melodies, especially the nocturnes, uh, and I could get I could rhapsodize on these melodies because they have midnight blue flavors, and when I see a, a moon out there at night, you know, a full moon. I was telling Barry the other night uh, when I saw him up at uh, Donald Walden's place that one of the most ambitious compositions I ever undertook came when I was going to his house. And in fact, his mother was having a chitlin supper for the guys. And I said, I was about 26 or seven years old. And I walked, you know, past this house and looked up and here was this beautiful full round moon with a uh, indigo sky, a midnight blue sky, you know, and uh, I stopped and looked at it and a melody leaped right into my head and it was in C sharp minor. That was the theme to a sonata that I eventually wrote that became the crucible for my piano style. That piece came to me on a full moon at night. I conceived it in C sharp minor because the melody occurred to me in C sharp minor because of the midnight sky. And that's a really deep, dark blue, you know, and the C sharp minor. So uh, uh, colors, music and colors. Now Roy Brooks says some of the same things. Uh, he, he, he says my color is A flat. I do know I get a lot of pleasure out of the key of A flat. One of my latest compositions uh, called uh, Romance, it occurred to me in A flat. Now let me play a little of that for you. I'm still working on this, but you know.
top 40 kind of love, are you? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Actually, uh, this, this, uh, the depth and miracle of reality is so ever present with me, I can hardly think of anything else, you know? I mean, uh, I know when I seek absolution of the spirit, when I have stress and all that sort of thing, all I have to do is think about the Holy One that is all around me. I remember one night I was coming from a very stressful day going to a job out in uh, Livonia. It was hot, it was about 95 degrees, and it was smoldering in the evening, you know, and the sun was just setting, and uh, there was that beautiful, brilliant blue in the east, gradually coming to the orange reddish horizon and it smoldered right over there right in that in the in the uh, west and then I, my eyes wandered up and i saw the brilliant white star and everything all that stress just vanished it vanished i took a deep breath like that it's, it really was it's it's you know what anyone who seeks uh, a religious experience has to come to a union with that which is uh, surrounding them, you know. And whenever you feel to the point where you're whole, you always feel yourself in that. So, uh, what, uh, what, are you, what are you putting out here that some uh, little cat is going to come up and say, yeah, Harold McKinney, that's the one. What are you putting out here for, for these youth? You mean advice for them or what? I'm talking about your determination, your conviction. Oh. Your well, technique, all of that. Well, one, um, the one thing I guess all uh, jazz masters, all masters of any kind would tell you that you have to spend the time with it. Genius, I'm one of these people that uh, I don't believe in what they call special talent. Reason why is because I feel that the human being is an infinite infinite phenomenon within himself you know there's a universe within and that uh, that person all one has to do is to spend the time and the enthusiasm and the love for anything they do uh, if a person wants to badly enough now it was said that Charlie Parker was a genius but according to what I have read he has he spent over 15,000 hours at his instrument be by the time he was 18 years old. So uh, there is a level of dedication. If you spend the time and, uh, and, and love what you are doing uh, enough to give it your all, the word is all, if you give it all, then automatically it comes, all of it comes to you. And, and that's what these men did. And Charlie Parker said, you have to live this music. You can't say, well, I'm going to get a day job and then play music on the side and expect to be as good as a Charlie Parker or a John Coltrane, you see? Uh, so um, I, had, I was working in the school system, you know, in, in Detroit because I had to support a family. And when I hit the big six, so I said, well, listen, I've, I'd been only six years in the job, uh, five years. I said, well, I, I'm not going to wait till I'm 65 to retire and do this. I'm going to do it now because I started out in this and this is what I want to do. So uh, that's what I did. I retired from the school system and went into, uh, I mean, I was playing the piano in the school system. That's the only reason why I could go there and feel like I could stay for five years, you know. But uh, it did not allow me, when I got home at night, I didn't feel like creative, creating anything, you know what I mean? And so, uh, or at least moving my own career, see? And so uh, I also felt like I had been retired from public life, you know? And uh, so I went on back into it. These concepts of mastery, you being a master, that you, I guess when we talk about them, it seems like they're just like puffs of air or whiffs of, a, of an aroma, but truly there's right. something that require sweat and blood and right. tears and hardship and pain and oh no, why am I doing this That's kind true. of thoughts. So art, um, well let me say it this way, love, dedication, all holy. Mm -hmm. These are all elements that you have poured into your 
work at the keyboard. Right. You know, it's a funny thing about jazz, too. I, uh, uh, jazz taught me a lot um, in the search for trying to do it and do it well. Uh, you cannot, I mean, first of all, it comes out of a religious experience in the first place. I mean, the, the jazz came out of the African religious experience. Some people called it voodoo, but voodoo or vodun uh, was an African religion. And, and that means that um, the idea is that you can be possessed. In the African religion, you can be possessed by a spirit a god if you want to, you see? And uh, this moves you out of the realm of the human into the superhuman, see? And I found this to be a very working, uh, real phenomenon in my life. I'm going to jam session, as I get deeper into the jam, uh, my mind becomes consumed by the music that occurs in it, and uh, I lose track of where I am and what I'm doing, and I just hear the music and my fingers are going on their own, hooked up to what that image is in my head. And I have, I remember one time I went to a jam session with Freddie Hubbard, and uh, Herbie Lewis was the bass player and some others. Well, Donald Towns recorded it. He said, man, do you know what you played? I had gotten into this thing, you know. And he said, you know what you played? And he played that thing. I couldn't even believe it was me. I, didn't, I couldn't believe it was, that I was the one that was playing all of this music because it was whole. And I was no inhibitions. It was just me obeying the image that came into my mind and it was whole, see? And that, once again, affirming this notion that may sound far out to some folk, but it's all is one. That's right. All is the same thing. That's true. Is there a composition you'd like to leave us with today? Well, let me see. I'll play uh, one of my favorites. It's called Wisteria. Ah, yeah. 